It's great to be here, and I, I'm really happy to be part of this particular session. Um, it feels like the morning was about all the sort of complexi complexities and possibilities from the technological side, and so it's really nice to be part of this discussion, which talks about that from the human <coughs> side. Um, I've been having a few moments of um, title regret, because even though I, I am going to be talking about this small intervention that we developed um, as a platform for talking about social media, Really, what uh, the thoughts and ideas I'm going to be bringing you for, to you today come from probably about seven or eight years of work now, much of it done with Dr. John Williams, who's in the audience, in which we've developed and, imp developed and implemented <coughs> randomized controlled trials to do interventions with high-risk African-American groups. And those groups tended to be very low income. And so I'm talking a lot about how it is we've uh, dealt with some of those challenges and making sure as we move forward and get excited about all these technologies that we keep in mind many of those challenges for people who don't have the same level of internet access that many of us do. Or media, social media access. Yeah, I'm showing my age as well. Um, so the, the, the intervention though that I want to talk briefly about, um, we call FEMALES, and I'll give you the acronym in a few minutes. But uh, the specific goal of this intervention is to evaluate two different interventions. One is called FEMALES, which stands for Females of African American Legacy Empowering Self. And the other is called HARP, which has been implemented for several years with our community partner, JWCH Institute, um, Healthy Alternatives for Risk Reduction Program versus Standard of Care. And we wanna compare these interventions and see which is most effective in terms of reducing risk behaviors and um, STIs at um, baseline compared to nine months follow-up. But we also have a secondary goal, which is very specific to social media, and I'll talk about shortly. So as, I, as you can see, we have these aims that have to do with reducing risky behaviors, reducing incidence of gonorrhea and chlamydia, and then of course we want to look at impacts on some of those um, maybe old school psychosocial outcomes that we've been interested in years, um, for years, <coughs> self-efficacy for safer sex negotiation, and for discussions with partners regarding HIV and STI testing. The specific intervention focuses on women who have high-risk partners. Um, that's one of the major selection criteria, not just the women's own risk behaviors, because we know that most African-American women are, um, their main risk is their partners, is often their partner's risky behavior, um, potentially risky behavior. Um, here's our postcards. Hopefully you've already received one from my project director who's out working the room. Um, and just a brief plug for one of our minor or small sort of efforts of technology is we have these QR codes on all of our push cards, or something, I mean, I'm sorry, on all of our postcards so somebody can easily scan it and go to our website and get the information that way if they don't want to pick up the card or if they lose the card. Um, but one of our major secondary aims is to explore the impact of females on the, on the use of new media, both for social support and networking, and also as a resource for information and um, identifying resources and services within communities. And I already said that we're testing these three different conditions, and I'm not gonna talk about those too much. Um, eligibility for the study is focused on African-American women. They said it's a study focused on adult women um, who have at-risk partners. And for several reasons, we focus on women who have either no health insurance, hopefully there will be fewer and fewer of those, or who have some type of publicly funded health insurance, things like Medi-Cal or a publicly funded Covered California plan. I'm gonna talk briefly about the curriculum of the females portion of the intervention, which is where the social media piece comes in as a major component. Um, the curriculum itself it involves six two-hour group sessions held over four weeks, and interspersed with those six sessions are three two-hour group sessions that are specifically on the use of media. Um, and these include um, some basic skill building for those who don't have it on computer skills, the internet, um, and then them, that group themselves getting together and developing their own educational intervention that could possibly dis be disseminated, ideally be disseminated via social media. There's many different interactive elements in the intervention itself. I've talked about some of them here, relaxation exercises, games, in the future, I'd love to use some of the apps that um, Margarita talked about in terms of measuring the effectiveness of these relaxation exercises. Um, and then participants regularly have assignments, and one of the things that we require or expect them to do is to 
post those assignments, which might be something like find where you can find out where you can purchase female condoms or obtain them for free in your neighborhood, to post them to a blog that other participants can use. It's more like a message board than a blog. So the social media component has these three main goals. Um, one is it ideally functions as an extension of the group sessions. The women in the group ideally will be supports for each other, will be learning, and as discussions can continue after the group sessions. So they have message boards that are limited to the people who are participating in that specific cohort, and that's where they post their homework. That's where they can um, discuss more of the topics that were covered in the sessions. They can also interact with the facilitators there. To increase their abilities to use social media in, in useful ways, as a resource for information about health-related matters, services, employment, etc. And then, as I said, we, each group at the end will create their own tailored message um, about some aspect of sexual health, and ideally then, and then be sharing that via their social network. So ideally that's a way of promoting sexual health and supporting their own behavior change through the feedback that they may later get from their social networks. So I say all that to share with, to share with you the framework of where we're going, um, and now I'm gonna talk more about some of the challenges that we've experienced. We are, just to share some important background, we did an earlier version of this intervention um, a couple years, I can't remember the exact years, I believe it was 2009, 2010. It was funded by CHRP. And we had a, actually a somewhat less intensive computer aspect of it, and we met many, many challenges with the success of that. Um, and one of the things that we found with the populations in both this study and in many other of the studies that we've done is that um, many of them actually have re relatively limited computer access. Um, and so um, Dr. Lightford earlier was throwing out some of the data from the Pew study that came out recently. And so it's true that there are, um, the, the digital divide has lessened and it seems to be more and more about an economics versus race. But the research I've done is focused on African Americans, so I, I kind of think about the two together in many ways. And one of the things they said in that study was that 64% of blacks with a high school education or less have internet access. So that still means there are 36% who lack that access, and it seems like we encounter a lot of them in our work. And so to address that, we um, address that in several ways. One is we've installed computer se sessions at some of the sites of our community partner agency that um, are intended to be available to participants as well as to other clients of those sites. We make sure computers are available during, before, and after the sessions that we're doing so persons can come early or stay later and, and, and do some of the things that they're learning or that they may want to do on their own. We pro provide participants with lists of locally available um, free stations, but those are almost always libraries. And so libraries are great, but there's often a lot of issues, right? Libraries don't have huge amounts of funding, they have limited hours. They can often be packed, so you may go to your local library and wait and then only be able to spend 15 minutes on there. And you may or may not feel comfortable talking about, uh, writing about personal issues or looking up information, more sensitive information with three other people sitting to each side of you. Um, African Americans in particular tend to have their main access to the internet is often mobile, mobile so we work to make our, our website mobile accessible, and we're even working to improve that to another level. And then we've also worked to include mobile-specific platforms. So as I said, there's homework assignments that um, participants in the session can do, and they can go online and post it, but they can also use a text feature on the phone to post to the blog without having to have that direct internet access. And of course, we're, getting, we're, level, we're measuring the level and type of access. Now in females, one that I talked about earlier, we had a very low socioeconomic group. 6.5% of our participants were employed, 75% had high school diplomas or less. Um, so when I talk about why there's such a low level of access, just give you a sense of what the participants that we're, we're talking about. Um, our efforts at installing computer stations, though, has not been as ideal as we would like. <laughs> <laughs> so, as, as I said, one of our partners is JWCH Clinic, and they run, um, I mean, JWCH Institute, they run several clinics. One is Linwood Clinic that we work with, and this was their best place that they were able to set up a computer station. This is a second patient waiting room. All the patients have to go through here. 
Um, but this is where they were able to set it up. And we explored with them many other options, but because this is a waiting room that children use, they didn't want something too low and easy to access. There were several reasons why this seemed to be the best place. Now, we're still working with them to see if we can approve this. But we worked hard to get to this point, just to, to say clearly. <laughs> Another thing that's the case is that um, this site and several of the other sites do not, they have internet access, but they don't have wireless internet access. So that's also another limit. Um, we have wireless, you know, our own wireless um, hotspot, those sorts of things. But we find that in a lot of sites in South LA, even that um, access tends to be limited. And so, I mean, I can't, if there are several places on my campus where I cannot use my cell phone. So to have wireless or have some kind of access and actually really be able to use it in a consistent way are actually very, can be very different things. Um, so I'm already running short on time. Um, another challenge we have is some participants' lack of familiarity. And you can see kind of already that we address that by trying to increase the number of, of female sessions, by requiring that people use it, even, make it more required that people use the internet component, even though if they may not want to, hoping that with the use they will feel more comfortable, to pair those participants who are more or less knowledgeable in the sessions. We were also very concerned if we start sending people out, encouraging them to use this tool, but who may not be very familiar, that they may um, <coughs> run into problems, run into information that's not very reliable, et cetera. And so we provide very specific guidance on safe usage, what are health messages or what are sites that may be reliable in terms, of, especially when you get to important health relate, related information, how can you assess the reliability of this information, et cetera. And of course, we, tr we track this participant's level of access and usage. Um, one thing too that we found interesting is that some participants seem to lack motivation to use this as a tool. We've had several interesting conversations within our cab. Um, when people are like, I can do everything you're talking about without using the internet. I can use 211, I can use to get information, I can do this to get bus schedules, I can do this to, to do that. And so people have found these resources um, in many ways, and oftentimes the social service agencies that support them are aware of that limitation, so there's alternate ways for people to do things that don't require the internet. And if you don't have a credit card, which many of our participants don't, the use of the internet for many things that we may find it very convenient for is not so much the case, um, at least for things that involve commerce. Um, another challenge that we've really worked towards addressing that I have some concerns about are the balance between protecting privacy and promoting participation. So we have this social networking piece where we want people to continue the discussion and I think the way that would be most useful is if it's on the platforms people are already using, whether that's Twitter or Facebook, et cetera. But in exploring that, we felt, we did not feel like there was a secure way we could do that and protect participants' privacy and confidentiality. So we, had, we went with our own separate platform for participants to do that, but that means they have to kind of do this more extra things and more extra steps, and I'm less sure that it's gonna be integrated well into their day-to-day -day lives as a sort of social support. So I am already running short on time, so I will um, just kind of go to some last points that I wanted to make. Um, a couple, one thing that's striking to me is that this whole issue with access is in some ways very much a domestic issue. My colleagues who travel often point out that they can get access much more easily internationally than here, and so I just find it striking that like, where are the internet cafes in Los Angeles? You know, where are, the other, where are the places where we can make this more accessible? And are there ways as universities we can think about that if we're really interested in public access to information and education? And then the last point I want to make, and, and I wish I had more time, but is that, especially given that ours is very consciously a race-related intervention. Our intervention is for African-American women. It talks about the ways in which African-American women are particularly are at risk for HIV and some of the um, associations of race and gender and homophobia that cause that. Um, it, it's striking to me that the internet, for me, is one of the race, most racist and homophobic places that I go. It's where I see the most blatant examples of this. Um, and I just want to show a few examples um, for the audience. So this was a picture that recently came out, the first picture of um, the Robin, I'm sorry, and her partner. And so the second comment was something like this, where somebody, the first comment complained about 
well, she doesn't really have to, sh people don't have to share about their sexual preference, and you know, then the second comment went on about, well, why is it people always having to inform us about their sexual preferences, as if heterosexuals don't do that? Um, <laughs> and then here's another example, and I won't show the third. Um, are, are people familiar with this ad? Yeah. So this was an ad that showed an interracial family, um, girl with the, girl, you know, the girls going back and forth between her white mother and African-American father with the Cheerios, and um, the comments were so negative and overtly racist that General Mills had to take down the YouTube site associated with these comments. So this is something that I just think about in different ways when we're, for us, in some cases, we're sending kind of newbies into this forum, and I kind of want to, you know, protect them. I feel this protective thing. I realize people may say that's maternalistic. Um, but I just think it's something we need to keep, keep coming, keeping in mind and coming back to. And you know, for us, it's some of it is part of the dialogue that they will have within the groups. But I don't know that we have a full answer as to the best way to do this. So thank you very much.